Aizermine, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I'm an architect by training. Um, I have, an, have a bachelor's from NC Lahore. I have a master's from MIT in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, my master's is a very academic one. It's, uh, it was in history, theory, and criticism in architecture. I practiced a little bit, but mostly I uh, moved around with my family, with my husband around the world, and I specialized in cultural tourism. That's what I did um, I, for uh, my career. Uh, I continued to write. I'm a writer and a journalist, so I'd been working on that. I did, uh, my projects were all based on cultural tourism or something connected to that. And all were connected somehow or the other to identity issues. Um, I was a I've been a producer. I produced a music video uh, with Shafqat Amanat Ali uh, to promote the northern areas of Pakistan. Uh, I, uh, I did produce a, a radio program called Another Pakistan. Uh, it was uh, sponsored in part by the Asia Society for Brown University's. Uh, um, program uh, with Christopher Lydon, who is a legend in NPR. He came to Pakistan and we did this uh, program that I produced uh, uh, called Another Pakistan and it interviewed different types of people. Um, so I was a producer in different media, uh, an architect, a writer, and uh, now I'm the founder of uh, Joy of Urdu. Wow, what, what is Joy of Urdu? So Joy of Urdu is a bilingual organization for the promotion of the Urdu language. Um, we have chapters around the world uh, and uh, we're basically uh, working on establishing ourselves as a publishing house. Uh, so give us a little background of Joy of Urdu. How did it all start? Yes, I, I guess you would ask that question because, um, you know, from being an architect and, and, and a producer in different media and cultural tourism and, and writing, you know, how do I now do this? So, well, first of all, before I even start, let me just say I've been doing it for seven years. So it's not just that I woke up today and I, oh, well, you know, now this is the flavor of the month. No, I've been doing this uh, consistently for seven years. And like I tell people, this is my bucket list project. So the way Joy of Urdu came about is that I've always been interested in language, in linguistics. Um, I come from a family of polyglots. Uh, I wish I were, I'm not. I've learned different languages in my life, but I'm not a polyglot because I barely, I mean, I did a beginner in a few of them, but you know, but I'm always impressed by it and it, and it, and it, it fascinated me and, and, and also a family of scholars. So questions of identity were things that I looked at even as a student. Uh, when I was 15, I, I got a scholarship to study at a United World College in Canada. I was the only girl in my class um, who I thought I was, you know, one of the good students. Uh, in my English literature class, and we had a day about on world literature, and all the other students were asked to speak about literature from their own countries and their own languages, and and I felt terribly stupid because I had nothing much to say because I had done easy Urdu in all levels, and uh, I think that's when I realized that there was something terribly wrong, um, I didn't, and that was a horrible feeling to have, and it's not nothing that we that we questioned when we were in Pakistan. I think uh, you and I have spoken previously, and I know you're going to ask me about this. We'll, we'll come back to this. Uh, but moving along, I um, was told that if I wanted to just reduce my uh, workload, uh, I should do the interna for the International Baccalaureate, I should write off my native language <laughs> in the first year. Uh, so that I have fewer, uh, you know, so my first question as a scholarship student was, um, am I going to lose my scholarship if I fail and am I going to get deported? <laughs> so my my guidance counselor said, nay, nay, you know, no problem. You will just have to sit for another exam. So I had nothing to lose. And I was like, okay, fine. Uh, because the, the reason why I thought I'd fail is because when he gave me the syllabus, um, 
he said you have to re- you have to do manto and premchand and i this is way back when um there was no internet back in the day of course that ages one immediately but now of course we've seen the movie it's all very cool blah 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 my question to that was what's a manto literally i mean i laugh about it now but it it's actually it's actually very telling so anyway so he, he so when he said any koi there's no issue as fine just you know when they send the syllabus can you they please send an urdu dictionary to unhone lughat bheji they sent a lughat they sent a dictionary and uh, i i tell i tell the story often that this is actually the starting point of joy of urdu really if you really look back and uh, connect the dots that um a couple of things if, or a rather few things happened when and one of them was that i thought i was coming up with this brilliant idea that i'm actually going to treat this literature like i treat any other literature that i'd been studying and i'm you know literature with a capital a literature and you know the way we we approach it and that i would use the same literary analytical tools that i'm studying other world literature and i'm going to apply them to urdu now this seems kind of like obvious doesn't it but to me as somebody who had never actually paid attention to it you know it was the worst subject that we had i hated it back in pakistan um i i find not i found nothing enjoyable about it so for me to look at that as a student was for me eye opening and 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 revolutionary in my brain because i never even looked at it in that way and so then when i when i studied it i realized that I, wow i really like it and then i was really surprised how much i liked it i ended up getting the highest mark that you can get in the international baccalaureate but later on when i looked back i was surprised at my surprise why should i have been that surprised that i'm going to enjoy that i enjoyed it so much and so there was a little seed that was in my mind and i thought we used to have all these teachers english teachers we loved them and we loved those english classes and you know i'd like urdu to be cool again one day i'd like why didn't we have cool teachers who came and taught you know cool teachers of by cool i think what i meant was people with whom who could really i didn't i could identify with people who would understand me people who spoke my language and made me love literature urdu literature the way i loved english literature why why that disparity so that's a, the first seed anyway cut to many many scenes blah 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 it's a long story i've spoken about it in in various uh, occasions um, i'll tell you. then i went back to pakistan to study architecture and one day we had a submission and there was a group project and we we had to submit this architectural project in the morning and of course it was we were all pulling an all nighter which is something you know all over the world architecture and architect architects and architecture students do and so some people were say you know doing antakshi somebody you know would play the guitar we would be getting you know from purani and arkali we would be getting a uh, uh, chai uh, you know uh, hot tea to keep us awake through the night because we had a few hours to finish this uh, project through the, we worked through the night so we were all you know somebody was doing something or the other to keep everybody going because we were so exhausted and so that nobody fell asleep and then this one friend uh, said uh, you know i'm going to read these ver- these verses by fares but uh, he said he he said nagawa nav ke neem kash dil reza reza gawa diya jo bache hain sang samet lo tane daagdar luta diya and i and and my reaction to that was that has a beautiful cadence to it it has a lovely rhythm and a sound and i love it but what the heck did you just say <laughs> no clue i didn't understand a word and so i asked him to explain that and uh, i got my first 
book of poetry, which was uh, Victor Kiernan's poems by Fez, which had the English and the trans Roman and then the um, sorry, it had the Urdu, it had the Roman and then it had the English translation. Um, and that was another moment in time where I was again thrown into the world of Urdu literature and, and poetry and language. Um, and then I went to, uh, I went for my master's. I was doing a course at Harvard with Professor Ali Asani and I wrote a paper on um, language in the subcontinent, um, Urdu language specifically in the subcontinent and uh, its socioeconomic um, implications. Uh, so, you know, the idea of Urdu medium being a derogatory term, of uh, the Sanskritization of the Hindustani uh, in, in India, the ghettoization of Urdu in India, and Pakistan, the uh, de-Persianization -pers or the Arabicization in Pakistan, and uh, that concept, so there are these political elements to it but then what was also very interesting was you know why this idea of this this derogatory term urdu medium right so why why, why does it have negative connotations um and you know people love saying these statements ke to chale gaye, hame chhod gaye, you know the 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 colonists left the subcontinent, but they left this um, sense of inferiority. And, you know, the, these are very, those simplistic, meaningless statements that we've grown up with. But if you start to really analyze them, they hold no water. They are absolutely meaningless statements. And so I started looking at it and I also thought, oh, maybe that has something to do with it. Now, it's far more nuanced and I'm not going to get into it you know, thousands of words, cup paper. But uh, just to give you an idea, you know, there are two movies that come to mind. One is a British, you know, the My Fair Lady, which is based on George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion um, and the play, of course. Um, and, uh, and you have Working Girl from the 80s, Melanie Griffiths, and this movie with Melanie Griffiths. And uh, I, I just wanted to give these two movies as an example, because it's not just Pakistan, but it's anywhere in the world. Language is communication. Language is telling the world who you are. So your accent immediately belies your socioeconomic background. It belies your, it, 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 it tells us where, what your geographic background is, and it immediately tells you what your socioeconomic background is, where you are in the, in the hierarchy of society, right? So in, in the famous movie, My Fair Lady, he takes this Cockney speaking flower girl and turns her into this very posh speaking, um, uh, you know, beautifully turned out. Now you can you can do a makeover, but he went further than that. He, it's a very interesting movie because he looks at body language, and we know how body language also conveys who we are and where we come from. So he made her walk with a book on her head, so she walked straight rather than you know walked in this kind of very like um, like the street urchin way, uh, like a, a person from a posh background. But he also made her speak and have different vowels and different consonants. And it's the vowels that often give your background away, not that there's anything to hide, but they, they do signify. Uh, and so it's interesting. And, and because I like languages and because I like listening to them, this really speaks to me. In, in the same way, look at Melanie Griffiths and Working Girl. She realizes she speaks, you know, she says these terms which are considered to be very, you know, like, like very ditzy, as they would say. So she drops those to move up in the in her career in, in, in the corporate ladder. Um, she uh, lowers the register of her voice. Margaret Thatcher did that as well. She spoke on a very, very low, like an artificially low register to make it in a world full of men. So she works on lowering the register of her voice, making it a little deeper rather than this high-pitched 
girly girly voice like which you know people wouldn't take very seriously and then she worked on her vocabulary and the kind of phrases that she used so what i'm what i want to what basically i guess what i'm trying to say is that it's not ke bhai colonists left you know angrez chale gaye hame chhod no those are simplistic statements that are, that are literally ridiculously meaningless and not nuanced enough because what actually is the issue is that initially the people who went to english medium schools were the moneyed or elite classes the children of uh, the rajas for example hsn college in lahore was known as chief's college because all the sons of the princes went to hsn college and um, it was kind of like a little you know a mini eton or something they were trying to create but in the subcontinent so it was very exclusive and that continued and then you had the you had the convent schools and the convent schools again the missionary schools they were english medium schools and they had a high level of education often they were private schools and uh, people who went there came from mostly uh, very educated backgrounds or very you know not just educated but a certain westernized elite because they were elite they were highly educated elite uh, who did who who were not comfortable in english um, they were you know the, the, the nawab so so they were they were elite in a in a way but this elite meant westernized elite because they spoke english so it turned out that if you if you didn't um, if you went only to the urdu medium schools you belonged to a certain socio economic class now this is what was true a few decades ago before the chain schools opened up across pakistan where the medium of instruction was english before these schools opened up i mean i'm sure you all know the ones that i'm speaking about before they opened up there were only those you know 100 200 300 200 year old schools out there they were few and far between the people who went there were were one type and everybody else. then there was everyone else so there was this demarcation so that idea that aspirational quality of english and why english represented a certain lifestyle a certain place in society then becomes sort of ingrained in in kind of our psyches and in our society so they, you know these are very very nuanced um issues and we could talk about it tonight and i've only just touched upon it there'll be there'll be many things that i'm sure people would like to argue or discuss further uh but i'm just you know saying that there are th- things are much more com- more complicated than than people realize um so the joy for the background was um i was living in moscow and uh, my child uh, for a few years we'd lived in pakistan uh, we'd been abroad all this all these years and moved to pakistan for three and a half years three and a half four years and then moved to moscow uh, moved abroad again and my child st- came home one day and he said don't speak to me in urdu don't speak to me in urdu i don't want to i don't want you to talk to me and i and i thought oh my god am i going to be one of those expat parents whose children don't speak urdu because that was always something that i was terrified of um and it freaked me out and i realized that you know the idiom that one is most comfortable in what is it's english we speak in english so my husband and i had been and i realized that, that is what we were doing wrong thinking that we grew up in a bilingual home and we learned to speak both languages comfortably but our child was growing up in a in an expat situation where he wasn't surrounded by a language and i would really 
have to make an effort. So I decided to go to Pakistan and buy all the books that I could find. I would, I would go from Moscow in the holidays. I would come literally bring back cartons of books. The problem was that, that they, I'm not saying that there weren't some good books. They were. But the kind of quality and the kind of books and the content that I was looking for wasn't there. And it was a personal choice. I couldn't find something that was that had the kind of quality that the English or Russian or French later on we moved to Paris. So it didn't have that kind of quality uh, in terms of production. And it, the books, the, the books also didn't have that kind of content. So I thought, yeah, you know, I'll have to just do it myself. And one day I just got really frustrated. I was reading my son uh, a story. Uh, I had asked the same friend of mine that, you know, you grew up in a very literary background and, you know, from, you, you, you guys grew up reading Urdu. So what did you read? And he said, um, Umro Yaar. And I went and I went, you know, went all the way to Urdu Bazaar in Karachi. I found Umro Yaar. It had some cartoons on top. So obviously it was a kid's book. I brought it home. And um, I was shocked because as my child, my four-year-old was sleeping and I started reading this story to him there was a point where uh, he talks, I mean, okay, I don't want to even talk about this on a, on, a, on, a, on a public forum like this, but let's just suffice to say that is not what you want to be reading out to a four-year-old. I was shocked and I thought, you know, has my, has my reading become so bad that I, I don't know what I'm reading? And then I, anyway, by that time the child was asleep and I went back, I went outside the room I opened my laptop and I don't know where it came from. It just popped into my mind and I said, Joya Furdu, this is my bucket list project. Now I'll just have to do this myself for my child. Now, you know, I think we need to do this. Um, for people like me who want to regain their literary heritage and for my child who I wanted him to have access to Urdu and I wanted him to have the kind of books that, 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 that I wanted him to have. Uh, that is really where it started from. But the seed, the idea had been brewing all my life, it seems. So um, I would go back to one of the first people. So interestingly, one of the you know people who supported me right from the beginning, there were people who had long arguments on that same post of mine in, on Facebook about why it was such a silly idea and why waste my time and, you know, all those dead anyway, why would you want to do that? Um, Sabine was one of the first people, Sabine Mahmood, was one of the first people who really supported me and you can see her picture at the back. Um, she's always looking over my shoulder, I feel, <laughs> because uh, we, Joy of Urdu owes her a huge debt because it's a project dedicated really to her. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, she came in the end of March 2015. She, she was in Paris for some conference and um, she came over. I was living in Paris at the time. She came over and spent, spent half the day and evening and we were talking and one of the first things she said was because I mean, what joy of Urdu project what happened about your joy of Urdu project and you know I said well I moved from Moscow to Paris and and I'm just you know trying to settle in so uh, you know I'll get to it or something like that and she um, you know, looked around and uh, I'm an architect so obviously my apartment was settled <laughs> so you know it was decorated and everything um and she looks around and then she looks at me and raises her eyebrows and says Aap to mujhe settled lag rahi hai. <laughs> so you look but she says you look pretty settled to me so please so i just burst out laughing i'm like yes yes, yes. And in other words you know like enough of the whatever get your act together and start working on it anyway when she left that day i said okay i promise you and i promise you this when you come you call me and whatever your, you know, whatever it is, uh, whatever you think are going to be the challenges or don't worry, you will always be, you, you'll get the help that you need is what she said. So I said, okay, then I promise that I will work on it. And I arrived on, I think Wednesday or something in Lahore. 
and she had this thing on Friday. Um, and I thought, okay, it's a big thing. She's busy. Let her get it over, get over with it. And on Saturday morning, I'll call her as, as we had planned. And uh, we all know, you know, April 24th and, and, and Friday. So as she was coming out of T2F, this happened. And, um, and I always say the same sentence everywhere <laughs> that, that, that Saturday morning call never happened. But from that moment onwards, I basically wrapped up everything else that I was doing and I just worked um, totally on Joy of Rhythm. Um, like with laser focus or something. Yeah. So, so that's the story of Joy of Rhythm. It's a very personal story, actually. A very practical story and also a personal story. What is Joy of Urdu? Uh doing currently, uh, you know, with the pandemic, with the COVID situation, uh, where is the joy of Urdu in this context? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, in 2020, we had a lot of things that were planned. Uh, we were going to be launching our publication, publishing house. Um, and we planned a very large international festival in Dubai called uh, Carpe Diem celebrating Sabine, celebrating her life. And we had worked with um, an international organization. Her mother was going to be flying in. Um, you know, we'd spend months planning this. Uh, and then we started to hear rumors that Abu Dubai, uh, UAE was going to go into lockdown. And so we just conferred and we said, you know, let's just postpone it for a few weeks. Ha ha. <laughs> Little did we know, right? So we said, yeah, yeah, we'll postpone it for a few weeks. And we'll postpone all our launches and everything else. And so um, we were, of course, when things continued to kind of not seem to be going back to normal, everybody got really depressed. And... Um, you know, we had planned this kickoff in Dubai celebrating Sabine, Carpe Diem celebrating Sabine. And it was based on something she said to me that evening in Paris, which was, you know, Marge to Marge, aaj to jile. Uh, you know, we were joking sitting in front of the Eiffel Tower and she said that to me. And so, I, you know, I remember that and it was Carpe Diem celebrating Sabine and it was going to kick off here and then all throughout our worldwide chapters, we were going to do some themed event. So months of planning that didn't work out many other things. So uh, we thought, okay, you know, a few weeks, a few weeks. And of course, but the good thing was that, that we pivoted very quickly onto our digital platform. And the reason for that was that because I've been traveling, you know, Joy of Udu started when I was in Moscow. Then I was in Paris, then I'm in Dubai, and, and our chapters are all over the world. I have been working with our international team of volunteers from day one online. So for me to go online was something I'd been doing for the last so many years anyway. It didn't make any difference. There was no change. But the interesting thing that we wanted to do was to do something for people, to let them know that, yes, it's, it's really depressing, but this is the time for you to just stay at home and read and share your reads. And we did this really surprise. We were really taken aback by how surprisingly successful it was, but it was called Ghar Bethiye Kitabe Padiye. And it was this phenomenally successful campaign that we ran where people, um, you know, wrote in or, or sent in their suggestions for books. And so many people wrote to us, so many people wrote to us to say it was a delight. And not only that, but they were encouraged to go and dust, you know, dust off their old books and open them for the first time, perhaps in decades. And, uh, and they said, we found this newfound pleasure. And then we were looking, somebody else would say something about a book and we wanted to go and, and read it. And so they thanked us for bringing sort of this joy of Urdu into this really dark lockdown period. Uh, we had a hundred, in the end, we shared over 190, 93 something videos from 40 different cities, uh, from five-year-olds to retirees, all walks of life, 
all backgrounds, all over the world, some Bollywood celebrities, uh, some celebrities of the media and theater and singers of Pakistan, writers, you name it. It was, it was amazing how people loved this. And then we started our online series, which was uh, we'd get sort of what you're doing in a way uh, where we have panel discussions. So we continue to have panel discussions throughout the year last year. And we, we do that. And eventually they turn into series. So we have. So tell me about, uh, you spoke about uh, Joy of Urdu. Uh, you know, they, they, there are a lot of volunteers who, you know, who participate in all the activities that you do. So tell me more about that. So we're very, very fortunate from day one. We've had amazing people with us. Uh, one thing that I knew was, uh, with great certainty, was that I don't know anything. So I have to have people who I can rely upon as advisors. And we are very fortunate that for everything, whether it's literature, language, um, any subject that we're working on for our publishing, we have an amazing international body of advisors who work with us on a voluntary basis. Besides that, we have a lot of young people who have just, who are really enthusiastic, who given us their time um, in terms of the graphic design or the video editing or the other million thing, little things, little research uh, or some kind of, you know, collecting some data or something. So we have a volunteer sign up form and people will, uh, you know, sign up for it. And then whenever we have a need, we will send an email out and ask them if, if anybody is interested. And, I think that we've just been super lucky that we've just had people who have selflessly given their time. I mean, from the youngest of our volunteers to our most senior of advisors. Um, I, there's no way that I could have done this for the last seven, eight years um, on my own without that kind of support backing me. Um, and encouraging me to, to keep going. Uh, and going to a harder question, what, um, or rather, do you ever get disheartened? Not a lot, but uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, luckily, because of these amazing people who are there, uh, who I rely on, who many of whom are not even uh, there on the screens, they're in the background, who I can call, uh, who will give me a little bit of perspective, who will give me a little bit of common sense. I, I think that I am not allowed to be disheartened for too long because they always cheer me up and give me hope and make me realize that we're all in this together and joy of Urdu is, is, has become a kind of a movement and it's become a movement because of all these people who are literally pushing me. And so, yes, I do get disheartened, but not for long. Uh, so, so what are your pet peeves? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so we call Joy of Urdu because our name reflects a bilingual nature. Um, and I like it. And we've been working with it for the last you know, seven, eight years. And we still have people who will say, why don't you change the name to something in Urdu? And you know, that's fine. But we are a bilingual organization, our name reflects that. Uh, and, you know, I used to try and explain that to people, but now it's just become annoying. Um, so that's one of my pet peeves. I think the other one is a 
unfortunately it's 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 mostly my pet peeve with the zeitgeist i think it's my pet peeve with the world right now uh, the sense of entitlement that everybody has um it it goes both ways one you are not allowed to be critical uh, or or criticize because if you do people do not want to be corrected if they are wrong which is probably why they find him akate so weird because you know, i'm constantly being corrected and i'm constantly making mistakes publicly um as dr arfa says i'm a guinea pig um the the other flip side of the same coin is that people feel free to be critical sometimes needlessly critical of things that they are being provided completely free of cost to them it costs us time and money and yes you should 100% tell us how we can make it better because obviously we want it to be good and how will we be good if we are not open to criticism that's not the point it's when people don't give constructive criticism but they will just criticize and say i don't really like this and they're part of your you know forum or online forum on joy of urdu and i'm thinking you know we didn't invite you you requested membership you joined this of your own free will and we have rules and it's just ethical and common courtesy that when you sign off that i will abide by the rules and one of the rules says very clearly joy of urdu is bilingual i will not criticize the use of english on this forum to promote urdu language and literature or make fun of it or make fun of people who are trying their hand at writing poetry maybe it's really bad poetry maybe it's truck art poetry but they're trying you know don't be judgmental about it don't don't be snobbish and say oh this isn't the highest class poetry of course we're promoting good literature but we're also promoting a love of the language and people will improve slowly so when people come in say that they're going to agree to our rules and then they break them i just i you know my my team says ke please <laughs> so may you just like stay out of it we will handle it because you know sometimes i really want to give people a, a piece of my mind um but luckily i have i have a great team that does it for me <laughs> acha <laughs> so you said the potential of initiative um ji i think there is a there is a uh, infinite potential there are uh great examples in the world where uh, dying languages or even some in some cases nearly dead ones uh they documented cases have been reintroduced and, and they become uh, these vibrant languages that have that that people are speaking uh urdu was never really dead ever uh, it was just going in that direction if the new generation was going to speak it uh now i think that me many other organizations uh have realized the danger have stepped up and created that little curiosity that little interest and as long as the interest is there as long as people are continuously trying to learn it speak it read it um it has you know all not just joy of urdu but all the organizations like us out there working to promote urdu we're not the only ones bahut acha log kaam kar rahe hain um there is a great potential that urdu will continue it is vibrant even now that it will continue to be vibrant in a much wider uh, base of speakers in a in the young generation तो मेरे ख्याल में जॉय ऑफ उर्दू का पोटेंशियल बहुत है और हमारे बहुत प्लान्स हैं आप हमारे लिए दुआ कीजिए प्ले प्रे फॉर आस एंड आर यू नो कीप अ फिंगर्स क्रॉस फॉर आर सक्सेस दैट वी आर एबल टू 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 अकॉम्पलिश ऑल द क्रेजी एम्बिशियस प्लान दैट वी हैव फॉर द फ्यूचर वी हैव मैनी प्लान सो लेट सी हाउ मैनी ऑफ दोज वी आर एबल टू अकॉम्पलिश बट वीव कम अ लॉन्ग वे 
So I think I think we'll get there. For me as well. So thank you so much, Zermine, for you know participating in our festival. And I am looking forward to uh, Women's Voices Lost in Translation panel uh, with you and Naima and Rabani and Shajid. So really looking forward uh, for that as well. Thank you so much, Sabine, for not only inviting me to that panel, it's a subject close to my heart, but also giving us, uh, you know, this keynote address moment to talk about, uh, you know, the work that we're doing. And I want to congratulate you uh, for taking on this much needed uh, and extremely interesting uh, literature festival. That so I, I just want to say thank you for giving us uh, the, pl the platform to speak about uh, Joy of Urdu and our work and share some of the things and our visions for the future uh, with other people and share our passion with everybody else and giving us uh, and other people like us uh, a platform uh, to talk about women in literature. This is really amazing work, Sabine, that you uh, and Anand K. Mag are doing. It's just, um, it, it's, it's an important idea. Uh, it's an important conversation to be had. Uh, you've really taken uh, a great uh, responsibility and you, you, you know, you've got an amazing uh, array of speakers. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you.